Now, but even these things, these issues which are so popular with Christians today, and I'm, I'm a supporter, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a fan of the sanctity of life. How odd does that sound? I'm a fan of the sanctity of life. I'm, I, I, I believe in creation care. I, I believe in care for the poor and justice issues. But even these don't really get at the heart of the issue because the heart of the theological issue around nuclear weapons is, is a question of theological anthropology. It's who we imagine ourselves to be in the face of God who we imagine a human being to be. And I just put this before you. We were made to tend a creation, to tend a garden, and we've built a device that could destroy it. This is enacted blasphemy. We have a power for which we lack all authority. You cannot be someone kneeling before the cross and simultaneously say, I hold this level of power over future generations over this many people, over over a spectrum of time. The Lord reigns, says the psalmist, let the nations tremble. It's not the other way around. And we have to recognize that these things are in fact sin. And once we recognize this, this is not some geographic map, this is sin. This is the devil's cigar stubbed out on the earth. And when you know it to be sin, then the decision's made up. Because we can't, all of a sudden we find our choices is over. Because we can't recognize sin and name something and be like, oh, well, but under these circumstances, I guess it's okay. It's not optional. Our decision is made for us. So, I'm asking you to hold that thought, that what we're really talking about here is sin. And then think about possibility, because I... Whenever I start talking with someone about nuclear weapons, I I really hate telling people what I do. Because I will tell them what I do, and then they will say, oh, well, nuclear weapons are awful, but what about, and X, Y, and Z. You know, it's impossible. That's impossible. It'd be like, you know, what do you do? I'm a youth pastor. Oh, pastoring youth, that's impossible. I mean, I don't even know why you you even do it. You know, it's it's that kind of dynamic. So I sort of, you know, I should tell them I'm a used car salesman or something. Um, this, This response is, it's impossible. But I would suggest that as Christians, our sense of possibility isn't determined by what we can see around us, but it's established by what God did at the cross and promises in the coming kingdom. And so to label something that you think is righteous as impossible is actually an act of cowardice and faithlessness in the redeeming power of God. You know, when the anti-slavery movement started getting um, traction in England uh, first and then America in the 1700s and 1800s, the frequent response was, that's impossible. It'll never happen. And the arguments made sense. It's not that they were stupid arguments. You know, it's uh, our whole economic system is built on it. Yep. And uh, if we don't do it, the French will do it, and they'll get a leg up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it would be so hard. What, what are, the, what are we going to do with all these people we've put into bondage? Uh, well, yeah, that, that is a challenging question, isn't it? But once Christians start naming the truth of the matter, start applying their unique vocabulary to the situation, and enough people start saying, you're right, that's the truth. That's the truth of the matter. Then even your sense of possibility changes because you realize that this thing that you thought was intractable was actually just a matter of will. And when enough people say, it doesn't matter whether I say it's possible, it must be done. It is wrong to keep people in bondage. When enough people start saying that, Impossibility, as Shane Claiborne has helpfully said about what we're trying to do, impossibility turns into inevitability. This is what we can bring to a discussion that sorely lacks it. Not as nuclear technicians, not as expert diplomats, not as people who are going to manage the minutia of how you get rid of plutonium and how you make transparent the nuclear fuel cycle, but of people who have the right vocabulary and sense of possibility to enact, to to be agents of redemption in the world. My first mentor um, liked to quote George Washington. I'm aware of the irony of juxtaposing a positive story about George Washington with the anti-slavery movement. My my first uh, mentor liked to quote George Washington at the Continental Congress of 1787. They were engaged in some, some debate. And George Washington, who hadn't really spoken that much, took the floor. And he said, it is too probable that no plan we propose will be adopted. 
Perhaps another dreadful conflict is to be sustained, but if to please the people we offer that which we ourselves cannot support, how will we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. This event and this event is in the hand of God like all events. But brothers and sisters, the standard is ours. It's shaped like a cross. It's shaped like a cross at which we say, full of faith, that God is reconciling all things to himself, including this this sorry, sorry world. And so, if we work for this, if we bear this standard, if we say that it is, this is wrong, this is wrong and there is a righteousness that is an alternative, and we are willing to seek it, then perhaps we can choose a different future. And God willing, someday within our lifetimes, the sun's going to rise one day over a world that's newly free of nuclear weapons. It'll be the first dawn of a nuclear weapons-free world in decades. And if that happens, if that day comes, and I pray that it comes, let it come in part because we raised our standard. Let it come because we raised our standard and we rallied to it and refused in the sight of God to let it fall. Thank you. Tyler, thank you for uh, sharing that. That's one of the things that Q we always want to do is expose people to what's what's happening here. Thanks. But I, I want to take it one step further. Um, you started a project yep. that's actually launching now called the Two Futures Project. Could yeah. you describe what the what that is? Kind of the campaign sure. side of what you're trying to do. Well, uh, this this is a this is a process that's going to take a long time. And what I'm committed to doing with uh, and this work has really exploded through a connection with Gabe and other people sort of in our generation have really embraced this goal. And so today, actually, you're the first people to see this movie, but it's on our website that went live six hours ago. Um, today we have launched the Two Futures Project. And the goal is to create a, a, an enduring, um, committed base of people who are going to see this through. Um, the, uh, there are a few ways that you can get involved. You can go here to our website, twofuturesproject.org, and uh, that's what we're looking to do. I actually have my dedicated asks. Can I give them? Yeah, please. All right. uh, there, are, there are a few ways you can get involved. I'm not going to waste this time. Um, one, we need everybody's voice. So if you are willing to sign a pledge of Christian conviction on this issue, very simple. Go to our website. Give us your name. As part of that process, you are going to send a letter to your... Uh, it's, it's automated on our site. Send a letter to your elected representatives, which makes a huge difference. When we go to Washington and say there's a movement of Christians and we flo- throw open the window and it's not just crickets, there are actually 500,000 people out there, um, <laughs> that makes a huge difference in what we're able to do with this issue. Um, the second thing you can do is spread the word. I would love it if this got the daylights twittered out of it. Um, uh, you know, so stop paying attention to me. Stop being present to the moment. Just Twitter. <laughs> Twitter your hearts out. Um, so the, pragmatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the third, the th- so tell your friends. Oh, please tell your friends. Uh, and the third, the third thing uh, is uh, we're launching a speaking tour. And so if you, I would love to partner with churches or conferences or events or campuses, whatever. We will come to you and spread this message and share why Christians should be involved. And I've got a meeting with, uh, this is not like, yay, 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 two futures, but it's, it's coming up. I've got a meeting with uh, President, uh, Vice President Biden's office uh, later on in May. Um, I would love to be able to say to him, look, we have 50 invitations from churches. In the first 24 hours, we got thousands of people signing up, something that could really add teeth to this. So we've got a a conference call with press tomorrow to launch it. We're giving ourselves 24 hours. Uh, I'd love to see what kind of response we can get in that first day. It's interesting. You think about newsworthy events, and one of the things interesting Tyler and I have talked about recently, even in the last week, a couple major news organizations have been in touch with us about coming to hear specifically this presentation because it was newsworthy that Christians were thinking about this issue. I commend you for taking this on. I know it's been years of sort of you being alone, thinking about a topic and an issue that was hard to relate to people about um, and having to sort of beg and drag and 
pull people into it. Um, but man, God has called you to this place, and it's been obvious over the last year to see you carry that out. Thank and you. thanks for doing it.